Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to our uh, Falling Walls Breakthrough Conversations. I'm Anji Hassan, Associate Editor at Nature Communications. And uh, with this unique format that's made possible um, in partnership with the Federal Ministry of Education and Research, as well as Springer Nature, we hope to be able to take you with us into the minds and experiences of our emerging innovators, our global science leader, our science entrepreneurs, and our outstanding scientists. Okay. So as a structural biologist, I'm very excited to welcome our next guest. Uh, our guest is John Jumper. And uh, John is the winner of the Breakthrough of the Year in the category of Engineering and Technology, along with its team at DeepMind, for the development of the AI system AlphaFold. Uh, he is senior researcher at DeepMind and received his PhD in chemistry from the University of Chicago, where he developed machine learning methods to simulate protein dynamics. Prior to that, he worked at DE Shaw Research on molecular dynamic simulations of protein dynamics and supercooled liquids. Uh, today, we will discuss breaking the wall to understanding life and how AlphaFold, which is capable of generating predictions of protein structures to atomic precision, uh, has rapidly advanced computational biology. He had a talk about that earlier today and how he and his team were able to harness the power of artificial intelligence to make predictions about the shapes of proteins approximately six million times faster than was previously possible. Welcome, John. Thank you very much. Very Excited nice to, to have you. Here. Yeah. So let me start with asking you how your life has changed after this breakthrough. I mean, your, your paper um, in Nature that you co-authored and published last year has over 6,000 citations, 6,000 citations. Um, could you have ever predicted the impact of AlphaFold? I think it's it's been incredible. What we were what we were pretty sure about, I mean, and in going into CASP, we we knew that it was a, a highly accurate system, and and at CASP we we learned it was uniquely accurate among um, systems that had been built up to that point, and we we knew that it was enormous progress on this long-standing grand challenge, right? The one that kind of Anthonson's defined how how do you predict the structure of a protein mm -hmm. from its DNA sequence. But I think what was maybe less clear is, was this going to be kind of the breakthrough in, the grand, in a grand challenge that's going to say the future is very bright for AI and computational biology, or was it going to be a really, really practical system? Was it going to be the ideas or kind of the system that's really important? And I think mm -hmm. what's been extremely meaningful for me and for us is what a difference it's made for experimental biologists. And, you know, I've been in computational biology a long time, and the most exciting thing for me is that experimentalists, you know, use AlphaFold, look at the predictions, and decide to do different and hopefully better experiments because of it. And I think the the extent to which it's been picked up by the experimental community in the first year has been absolutely beyond our, our expectations. It's been really, really incredible to see. It's really impressive, to say the least. <laughs> and in your, in your point of view, what helped AlphaFold succeed where other protein structure prediction methods, I don't want to say failed, but came <coughs> short? I mean, I think uh, from an output point of view, obviously, there's just enormously higher accuracy, about three times more accurate than other systems that had been other state-of-the-art uh, systems or three times lower error. But I think from a kind of methodological machine learning point of view, I think really we found the right way to build our protein knowledge into how we did the AI work. Mm -hmm. That it was, you know, I was trained as a biophysicist. It's, it wasn't about, and kind of even the AlphaFold 1 system that we built was about using off-the-shelf AI techniques and building our protein understanding around it and how we built the remainder of the system. And in AlphaFold 2, we were really looking at how do we take everything that we understand, everything that, you know, about biology, evolution, protein physics, and build that into the pieces of the machine learning itself. Put it inside the AI component, make the AI component practically the only component of the system. Not quite the only, but almost. And I think really that's very, very difficult to do. There's a lot of technical details, but I think ultimately it's very, very successful because we're all, I mean, it's not, in some sense, there was an incredible data resource that's been built over 50 years, the PDB, but everyone had access to the exact same data resource. Right. It was about putting the protein understanding into the AI and the machine learning Thinking itself. Thinking out of the box. Well, <laughs> it, yeah, I mean, there, there are others, but like finding the right way to do it. And I think mm -hmm. also having an interdisciplinary team, 
having a lot of really great machine learners that became structural biologists over the course of the, of the project and really thought about how to really treat kind of the biology, biophysics on an equal footing with the AI and how they built these systems and, you know, getting lucky and, and having a talented team, I think all of that contributed. Mm -hmm. Uh, we'll come back uh, to the interdisciplinary importance of interdisciplinary teams. Um, but speaking of artificial intelligence or AI in science, it has had its fair share of skepticism. And uh, do you think that the success of AlphaFold has turned some skeptical scientists into believers? <laughs> I think so. I think, I, I very much think so. Certainly within the narrow field of of structural biology, I think there was there were these very interesting moments, you know, and I, I could see it. I kind of checked Twitter after the paper came out, <laughs> and you would see a lot of, you know, oh my goodness, how in the world does the AlphaFold database have a, a, you know, very very close picture of my structure, right? It's always easy to think like these computational systems can maybe solve the easy cases or solve other people's mm -hmm. structures, but no, that's one I worked really hard on, and so. I think there's this kind of narrow point, but the, the larger point is really, it, it was a problem that we kind of, and even me at various times, thought we were gonna really need like molecular simulation and really like the physical or some other route to it. And the, the AI route was, was not as obvious, or it was thought that maybe this would only work at the family level, not at the detailed interactions. Mm -hmm. And so I think really, um, that started to convince people, well, if this, if this is possible, what else is possible? And I think even internally for us, it starts to say, like, we, we redefine which problems look too far ahead. Right, right, yeah. And um, so despite all the great leaps that AI has taken, um, like AlphaFold, for example, there's definitely challenges that still remain, right? And um, what are some of the challenges that you still face when you're developing these AI systems? I mean, I think one big challenge, uh, AlphaFold is definitely developed on top of the PDB, which is an extraordinary resource. And now uh, a little over 50 years old, and really, and thanks to the, the journals among others, that, that represents kind of the full output of the structural biology community, that, that structures that are published are always deposited. And so you have this incredibly diverse data resource, right. and you know what's important, you have this, um, incredible evaluation in terms of CASP, which does blind prediction. Mm -hmm. And so you can really know what worked, or at least what system worked. And in a lot of other areas of biology, or even, let, let's say, narrower, even in the areas of structural biology, I think, I um, can't remember who, who said it, but I was at a, on a panel once and someone said, there's no PDB of dynamics, or there's no, like a lot of the questions we want to understand mm -hmm. in cellular biology, how proteins move, their energetics, right are much more data poor, and so we're gonna have to look to different ideas or different methods to capture this, we think. So I think that's one of the big challenges, is that there are a couple of really incredible resources, PDB, Uniprot, and other sequence databases, mm -hmm. but not that many. And then I think the other is really, it has a nicely defined, a well-defined question. We knew what we were looking for, we just didn't know how to get it. Mm -hmm. And in a lot of scientific problems, you don't really know what you were looking for until you find it. Right, right. And so that's always a challenge. Mm -hmm. And uh, since you mentioned CASP uh, more than once, I have a question oh, yeah. here. I wanted to ask you about that. Um, so CASP is short for the Critical Assessment of Protein Structure Prediction Experiments. And um, this is a community-wide experiment. So uh, how important do you think these experiments are in advancing scientific research? I think they're I think they're really important. I think the the story of CASP is really really interesting. So it started way back in 1994 when in essence there were a bunch of claims that protein structure prediction was essentially solved. I mean, you can see so John Malt, one of the founders of CASP, has given some wonderful talks on this mm -hmm. where people say we can predict structures to essentially one angstrom and so the John and uh, Christoph Fidelis and others decided well maybe we should actually test that. And instead of testing that on proteins where everyone knows the answer, mm -hmm. we'll uh, collaborate with experimentalists to get solved but unreleased structures and we'll actually check the accuracy. And the initial results were um, disheartening to say the least. It was, it was found a reality check. <laughs> yeah, it was a reality check. It was using 
the, the methods we had on the problems that people actually wanted to solve, the ones in which they didn't know the answer until the experiment they'd just done, and it really told people that the methods didn't work yet. Mm -hmm. And of course, there was progress over time, and every two years they ran this experiment, and it both was a reality check on progress, mm -hmm. but not a limit on methods. You could do practically anything without a pipette, or really anything that gives an answer in two or three weeks. So you could do any method or use your creativity, but it also defined what we meant by the protein structure problem, mm. is that it became, this is, this is where we'll all meet, we'll test our ideas, and this is the kind of problem we're going after. And I think it had a very aligning effect on the field. Now, it's very interesting to think about this in the sociology of science. Right. And so it was very important to us to know, like, it, evaluation is so hard of machine learning methods and making sure you're really measuring what biologists want. And having these assessments is really important uh, to do that kind of work. Mm -hmm. And do you think um, that similar, similar community initiatives uh, would be beneficial in other disciplines? I think absolutely. I think it's a lot of work to put together, and I think there are others. I think there's KG, and there are others that have a critical assessment of genome interpretation, mm -hmm. and there are others that are being put together. I think it's a really great place also for experimentalists to get involved and say, this is what I really want. Talk to me when you can do this. Mm. And... Um, and it's also very, very important because it's so easy. It's so easy in retrospective computational work to think you're predicting something and find out that you've accidentally included your test data in your training set or something else. And so this aspect of blinding where everyone knows that the results are like you're using it in a real problem is really important. I think it's a really interesting model. Mm -hmm. And I think this takes us a bit into uh, back to interdisciplinary and um, so we, we hear a lot about interdisciplinary approaches in science in general. How important is that in artificial intelligence? I think it's extremely important. Mm -hmm. I think it is, I think people think too siloed about, especially a problem like AI and science, which is really three things. There's the AI portion, mm -hmm. there's the science, in our case, structural biology, and then there's AI and science, which is its own kind of distinct entity in terms of how we think about these specific right. problems. And it's really, uh, we found it really, really important to bring together people with different backgrounds. I mean, so I have a kind of bi computational biophysics background. Quite a lot of people had a pure AI, ML background, mm -hmm. machine learning background. And, and all of those, you really kind of want to work together because ideally, it's not just kind of throwing information over the wall. It's about daily conversations over coffee. It's about really iterating at very high frequency and really understanding each other because I think the best science is done. Ultimately, the scientists themselves have to become interdisciplinary and you can only really do that within an interdisciplinary team. Right, right. I think uh, yesterday also at the table, uh, people were discussing um, how most scientists now really need to include also coding, right, in their training because it's, it's a base for a lot of things now, including AI, of course. Absolutely, and I think it's even, I think it's, and one of the really interesting things for me, and you know, I've, I've worked with experimental biologists, and I've done AI work and worked with a lot of AI scientists, and there's interesting parallels. Like, mm -hmm. I think people, people assume, or sometimes assume in computation, that you write down equations and you derive exactly this, whereas most AI scientists proceed a bit more like experimental biologists, where mm. they try things and as they try different approaches on the particular problem they're working on, they build their own intuition locally. Like these are, as we built AlphaFold, it was, you know, we shouldn't include this type of thing that will always go badly. We should, th we should be thinking about these sorts of pieces. And we, you know, we still fail nine times out of ten, but we start to kind of zero in on the problem, on the set of ideas that work. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think that that's that kind of approach really, really works well in, a, in an interdisciplinary and in a team setting where you're exchanging ideas right. really rapidly. Mm -hmm. And uh, with AlphaFold, you've contributed to solving the protein folding problem. So what other problems are you currently working on solving? So <coughs> we're really, I think, so at least my team, I mean, I should say that DeepMind itself has a larger uh, science initiative and is working on different things, have some genomics work out, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But I think uh, for, th for our team, we're really interested in some of the questions around mutations and dynamics. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we're, and, and interactions in general. We're very interested in, in 
you know, how do we connect mutations to changes in function of the protein out to uh, relationships to disease? How do we understand multiple states and energetics? And I think these are problems that we don't know how to solve yet. I mean, there's good work in the field, there's work we've done, but I think it's really interesting to think about these next set of problems, that ultimately there's a lot of really big questions in biophysics that we want to understand, because ultimately we want to contribute our understanding to cellular biology, to drug design, et cetera. And I think we're, we're really hoping that the same kinds of methods and ideas will be broadly applicable and, you know, being in an AI research group, hope that there are some new ideas that must be developed. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, a, it's an exciting time and you can start to dream more about these problems. Yes, and I think everybody will be really excited to have a chance to use those methods. Um, so you recently won a very prestigious award, uh, the Breakthrough Prize in Life Science. Congratulations. Oh, thank you, with Dimas. Sorry? Yeah, yeah. and with Dimas as well. Yeah, yeah, uh, congratulations on that. What does winning an award like that mean to you? Is it, is it sort of like winning the Oscars for actors? A and do you think that scientists, they try to um, strive to win these kinds of awards is it, or is it more the research that drives you? I think it's always the research. I think the awards are, are really nice and it's a really nice kind of validation that it matters. I will say like the reward is incredible, but so are the 6,000 citations, and especially like <laughs> looking very through. very rewarding recognition. Oh yeah, and <laughs> we're looking through the citation list and seeing all of these kind of papers by just in random biological areas. Mm. It's just, you know. I think, I think to me, I mean, the award was incredibly, was incredible like recognition that it mattered. I, I do kind of believe, I can't remember who said it, but you know, you want to do work that would be worthy of these prizes. Whether you win them or not is is more is more da somewhat random or out of your control. But mm -hmm. you want to do that kind of work, and it's a validation that we did that kind of work. And so and so, I guess that's that's what it means to me. Is it's really it's really this kind of solidification that people thought it was so significant. And, I, and it's really, really surprising to win them as quickly as we did, I mm. think. I think uh, a, lot of a lot of innovations in biology take years to become apparent how significant they are. And so it's, it's the pace of it has been really surprising. Yeah, it shows you that you really solved a problem that was a, a major problem for a lot of uh, scientists, right? Yeah. yeah. I just want to remind our audience that you have a chance to ask questions, so just raise your hands and we will unmute you and you'll be able to ask John your questions live. Um, you mentioned yesterday at the plenary table uh, on AI in medicine how excited you are about how AI can accelerate development of drug discovery. And uh, so can you explain to the public how your research enables drug discovery? So, yeah, absolutely. And I think there are a couple of areas, and I think this is one area in which there's both the acceleration from what we've done and what the kind of research ideas mean. So in terms of a portion of it is kind of direct discovery. So drug discovery, for those who don't know, normally proceeds by identifying what is called a target, a protein in the body who you think that, or who the scientists think that intervening in will be beneficial, often by stopping its function. And then you often need to find out more about how it works or who it interacts with. You need to understand its structure. And so in, many, in a lot of cases, if it's a newly identified target, and we're getting better at identifying targets, um, you want to know its structure to start your work, and so AlphaFold has become a starting point for that. We're also seeing use in design of the interactions themselves or how we build uh, biological units to uh, bind to these proteins. And I think the, maybe the, the medium term is there are a lot of other problems like protein-drug interactions, protein-protein mm -hmm. interactions, where we expect to see quite rapid progress with similar ideas and with new ideas. Right. And that's going to start to mean a lot, I think, for the early stages of drug development. We're trying to build an intervention against a specific target. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, we have run out of time. Um, I want to thank you very much, John, for this conversation. It was very enjoyable. I hope you enjoyed it as well. I did. Thank you. Yes.